Sam, I completely missed that. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, this is what happens when I try to do multiple roles. <laughs> I guess I'm not multi-talented, as Sarah Dorsey kindly suggested. Um, okay, and then uh, we also have uh, Maggie Murphy, uh, who is here with us today. You can see her lovely headshot. Um, and she is the first year writing visual arts and humanities librarian. Um, so she does college writing, which is the sort of name of the overall program that houses English 101 and 102. And she is also the liaison to philosophy, art, history, religious studies, and history, art and art history, religious studies and history. Um, so that's sort of, there, there are two primary first year instruction librarians, but as we'll talk about later, um, and art education, thank you, Maggie. Um, we, uh, have, we have lots of help that pitches in and helps us out. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about what CST 105 is. Um, just give you a little bit of background information. And so just so you know, um, in the current general education program, and just to step back a little bit, I won't talk about Jenna too much because as many of you know, I could talk about it for days and days and days. Um, in the current general education program, it's classified as a reasoning and discourse class. Um, and just one thing that I'll point out because it's very strange to me, it's actually not classified as a speaking intensive class. Um, speaking intensive classes are something that's required in the current program, um, but it's, it's not. Um, but it is required for a lot of majors. Um, so for example, business administration is a major that requires students to have taken CST 105, and that's true for several um, majors across campus. Um, so students take it to fulfill this GRD requirement, um, and also because majors tell them that they have to. Um, so it, the, the main purpose of the class is to provide introduction to public speaking, but also to small group communication, and also just kind of a, you know, a basic introduction to the different types of communication. Um, but we work primarily with the public speaking part. So we, we sort of divide CSC into like pre-2016 and post-2016 because there was a major curriculum revision done in 2016. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what it was like before. So back in, back in the old days, from the time that I took over, um, until 2016, they had three speeches that were required. Um, the first one was called Any Old Bag. The students loved it. Just kidding. Um, it required students to have a bag, any old bag, and they had to put um, something in it that represents their past, something that represents their present, and something that represents their future. And then they had to do a speech about it. Um, so basically that was a pretty low stakes sort of introduction to public speaking. It didn't require research. It just required students to talk about themselves, um, <clears throat> sorry, in a somewhat organized way. Um, then there was an informative speech. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, there is, there was research required for it, but as the slide says, there were different expectations. Um, most people did the same assignment. Oh, I guess I should point that out. Sorry, let me back up a little bit. Um, so in Communication Studies 105, um, there is a course coordinator who's in charge of all the sections, and they do have a common syllabus, which means that all of the students in all of the classes are, are basically learning from the same assignments, the same student learning outcomes. Um, the instructors do have some flexibility on, you know, requirements for specific assignments and for due dates and things like that, but basically they're all taught from the same syllabus and do the same assignments. Um, and that's, I think that's just important to note because on the other side, which we're not talking about English 101 and 102 today, but they do have a lot more freedom to craft whatever sort of assignments they want to do, um, where Communication Studies 105 is a lot more um, standardized across all the sections. 
Um, so then the persuasive speech is kind of a typical, you know, persuade somebody of some sort of argument. Um, and they did require research, but we typically weren't involved in that process. So um, library instruction for these assignments typically happened before the informative speech. So the informative speech though involved two different choices. Um, they could do what was called a living history speech in which they had to interview somebody in their lives who had lived through something and then um, do some research to kind of go along with whatever the person had lived through. Um, sorry, I keep having to clear my throat. Um, so, you know, they could talk to a, a parent who had lived through, I was gonna say like the Vietnam War, but that's wrong. They, grandparents lived through that. Um, so they could interview somebody in their lives that had experienced some sort of event or something that happened in history. Um, the other option was called a community engagement speech in which they would have to interview someone who was involved in some sort of community organization or something like that and then do research on that sort of organization. So if you've ever taught library instruction before or anything like that, um, you can probably see where some issues might arise here, depending on which option the students went with, they would have very different resources to draw on, whether they're looking for historical information or information about a specific, perhaps local organization. And the organization could be anything from like the food pantry at their church to you know, Habitat for Humanity or anything in between. So um, it definitely presented some challenges in the library instruction part. So again, this is where we saw them right before this speech. Um, we had to talk a lot about how to evaluate websites um, because, you know, the, I don't know, first Baptist church in Gastonia's food pantry is not going to have a lot of information in the library databases um, that so we had to talk about websites and how to pick good ones. Um, we had to talk about keywords and how to develop keywords. Um, we did have to talk about library resources and we of course also had to cover APA style um, and it varied a lot. We actually didn't see all the sections. Um, some of them we didn't see at all, some we saw for 20 minutes, some we saw for a whole class period, it just depended. Um, I realize now that I was supposed to switch over to Jenny now, so I'm going to switch over to you now. Is that okay? Sorry, I told you, I, was got, I got on a roll. Sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah, no, this is totally fine. Um, the only thing I would add to what Amy said is that in like 99.9% .9 of cases, these were one shots. Um, which if you're not familiar with that terminology, it just means we see the class one time in a semester. Um, so you can imagine how challenging it was um, in sessions ranging from 20 to more frequently 50 to some 75 minute sessions to try to do all of this stuff effectively. And that's always been sort of a big struggle with CST 105. Uh, Rachel will talk later about how she's, um, I think, really made some strides in uh, fixing some of those issues. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this is tough. It's a lot. It's a lot to cover. Okay. So a common issue based on that, as you might expect, is that there was just not enough time in the sessions. So we were just like they were very coverage oriented. We were having to talk about. Uh, the ABC evaluation criteria for websites, which was also in their book, uh, their textbook for the class. Um, basically, the course instructors were told by the director of the course, um, and this is something we agreed to, that basically our library session was then covering this particular chapter of the book so that the TAs or instructors who were teaching it didn't have to do that um, because this is a standardized and extremely packed course. When you have something like three public speaking assignments where they are 
literally getting up and doing speeches or if they're on in an online format they're still recording themselves or doing them live it takes a ton of time um, so it takes a lot of class sessions to get those done and so timing is very tight in these sessions um, so we had the one session to work with where we were sort of teaching the evidence chapter in their book but there was just so much to cover um, one of the things that came up a lot was that students were often unfamiliar with the assignment or just didn't have options or topics selected. Um, this is partly because of the way we have to schedule these courses. Um, the different sections for first year TAs, and I think Rachel's going to talk a little bit more about that later, um, are assigned a day to come to the library and some of them come very early and some of them come a couple weeks later. So the ones that come really early uh just kind of maybe hadn't even barely looked at the assignment or uh didn't know which option between the living history and the community engagement topic they were going to do so in 2015 i added a pre-survey um to help with this because basically uh it forced uh the students in the class well really it forced the instructors to make sure that students had seen the assignment and had come up with at least one or two ideas and the pre survey also that's evolved over time, but it has a few questions about like what citation style is required in this again things to make sure they would really seen the assignment. One of the issues that really came up is this lack of transferability between that informative and the persuasive speech, especially because of the kinds of research that were required for the different options. So if you were only looking at websites because you were doing the community engagement option, like the example Amy gave of the church food pantry, it's going to be really hard to transfer that into doing research for the persuasive speech that required really a lot more, often scholarly or academic sources were really expected. Um, the other thing was um, there was way too much instruction for one librarian to handle this. So we had to do a lot of volunteer recruiting. We used some of our ROI interns. I had a pretty good run of great practicum students who were helping me with this. Um, but it was just, it, it was a lot because at the time that Amy was doing this and at the time I was doing this, um, as first year instruction coordinators, we were doing both CST 105 and the college writing program, English 101, 102. So it was extremely overwhelming to try to do all that and also have liaison responsibilities and other, you know, other duties as assigned. So these were just some of the big issues that we saw as we were kind of going through um, thinking about CST 105, which I, I think the three of us, Amy, um, myself and Rachel have thought about CST 105 a lot over the years. So, okay, Amy, I think we can go to the next one. Thank you for your service. All right, some big stuff changed in 2016 to 2017, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So, there was a major change to the course. They redid the entire, uh, like the whole syllabus of the course, the structure of the course, the way the book worked, the way they gave assignments. Um, so they got rid of any old bag and they had these three new speaking assignments an introductory speech, which kind of served the same function as any old bag. It was just something sort of personal to them. No research was required, no citations. They're really not even supposed to need like note cards because they're supposed to talk about something that's really important to them. The second speech wasn't informative anymore. It was persuasive. So they moved that up in the semester and they really beefed up the research requirements. So we they had they have still this is still the syllabus that they have now again which rachel will talk more about but students for this had to have a total of five sources two of them had to be peer reviewed so this added a whole new element to what we would have to teach in this class and then the third assignment instead of a persuasive speech this was a sort of group assignment called a roundtable dialogue um, and the way this works is that they're in groups of five one person in the group is a moderator and then they choose, They all choose a topic and um, there are two on one side of the topic and two on the other. So it's set up almost like a debate, but it's very researched and sort of rehearsed. Um, but every member of the group in that 
particular case is required to do research. So we shifted, I worked pretty closely with Jessica McCall, who is the course director for CST 105, to shift how we were teaching. And so it was still about the same time in the semester, but we really had to make some changes because we were doing a persuasive speech that had these new uh, sort of, again, beefed up research requirements. Okay, I'm ready for the next slide. Okay. Another big change in the library at that time um, in the year 2016 was that we hired a new first year instruction in social sciences librarian. Um, so you, again, like I said, this is kind of a theme. This was made possible by Nancy Rickman's retirement. So when Nancy Rickman retired, we had to look holistically at our department and figure out um, what the best way to uh, sort of maybe potentially repurpose her position would be. And what we found, again, was that we were, we were dealing with this first year instruction situation where um, things were, uh, it was just too much for one person. Um, so we did kind of a shift. We tried this new position, first year instruction, social sciences. I still stayed in my role then as the first year instruction coordinator, but I worked almost exclusively on college writing um, and then sort of more planning, assessment, large scale stuff. And the first year instruction in social sciences librarian took over CST 105 coordination. Uh, we also added something new that year. So uh, the, the, the first year instruction in social sciences librarian at the time, um, I'm not like purposely leaving her name out. She just doesn't work here anymore. Her name is, was Kayla. Many of you may have known her. Um, so we have, um, there was a project that the course director, who I've mentioned a few times, Jessica, wanted to involve the libraries and the speaking center more in that third assignment, the roundtable dialogue. So we piloted in a few sections um, some workshops for specific sections, the uh, first year TAs, which Rachel will talk more about later, um, ha had us come in with uh, representatives from the speaking center to help those roundtable dialogue groups through the beginning of their research process. Um, and this initial collaboration culminated in an article that's in the Communication Center Journal, a peer reviewed journal. Maggie actually took over working on that chapter with the Speaking Center representative Aaron and with Jessica um, because Kayla left during the um, development of that uh, particular journal article. But it's a great article, really interesting. Um, and just as an extra nice thing, uh, the Communication Center Journal, I am pretty sure, is um, hosted through our OJS, through the university libraries. So it is uh, lots of nice collaborations there. OK. Uh, big change in 2017. Oh, no, what happened? Amy, I'm senior. OK. Can you go back one? Sorry, I was trying to multitask also. OK, here we go. Big changes in 2017. I became the information literacy coordinator in January of that year. I took over supervising the first year instruction librarians. Um, so at that time, we still had um, Kayla as the first year instruction in social sciences librarian. Maggie was hired that year in the first year instruction humanities librarian position, which focused on college writing. Um, that summer, right, pretty soon after we hired Maggie, um, Kayla uh, left um, after a year, she sort of decided that the um, tenure track librarianship wasn't a good fit. Um, and so the fall of 2017 was a, a major scramble while we were trying to hire a new first year instruction in social sciences librarian, still cover all the CST 105 classes. Um, so I did a lot of them that semester. Um, Maggie did a lot of them that semester. Amy did a lot of them that semester. We kind of all had to really pitch in um, because as Rachel will talk about, this is a high enrollment class with a lot of sections. Um, so some, some things changed in 2017. Um, not all of them were, were great, and then, but some of them were, like bringing in Maggie. Um, but uh, we were in a real struggle position there towards the end. But luckily, uh, we were lucky enough to hire Rachel Olson. And I'm going to turn it over to Rachel and let her talk next. Cool. Thank you. So my internet is a little spotty. According to Zoom, it keeps giving me this message. So if you have trouble hearing me, 
uh, just drop it in the chat and I can repeat whatever gets cut out. Um, <clears throat> so I came on in 2018 in January. And um, so just a couple things, you're good, a couple things. Um, so there are about 50 sections of CST 105 that get taught um, every semester. Um, and in fall 2019 and spring 2020, that amounts to a little bit more than 2,500 students. Um, and it's important to note that not all of these students are coming to the library, um, but it is a significant amount of, you know, face time that we need to provide to these students. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how I've tried to address some of that um, using some of the strategies that Jenny talked about as well. So. Um, so who teaches CST 105? We've talked about it a little bit. Um, most of the, or many of the people who teach it are TAs in the Communication Studies Department. Um, so first year TAs are required to come to the library, bring their classes to the library for an instruction session for 50 minutes. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between a 50 minute session versus something else. Um, and basically, if is a more interactive way of teaching chapter seven of their textbook, which I've dropped in the chat earlier. Um, Leah, who's our health sciences librarian, she actually helped to write that chapter um, and it uh, has been in use for a long time, still used today. So um, yeah, uh, not all CST and inst 105 instructors have library sessions. Only the first year TAs are required to do it. And that is completely okay with me. A lot of instructors, um, have been doing it for a long time and have their own methods of teaching it, but um, we do want to offer it to anybody who would like it. I would say right off the top of my head, probably 75%, maybe a little bit less than 75% of CST 105 instructors usually do some form of library stuff with us, whether that's bringing their classes or completing one of the online options. So um, it's relatively popular and, uh, you know, we're always looking to grow. Um, so I do most of the instruction for CST 105 in terms of library uh, time, but uh, we still have the problem that, if, you know, 50 sections per semester and they have sort of a very similar syllabus. So the assignment that we work with them on is happening at the same time of the semester for every class. So they all want to come within the same two to three weeks, um, most of most of the sections. So that creates a challenge. So other people from ROI um, will often step in. If you want to go to the next one. These are some of the people who have taught CST 105. Um, this is just since I've been here in 2018. There are many, many others who have uh, stepped in to help over the years and, you know, very much appreciated. But Jenny, Maggie, Amy, Sam, Deborah, Melody, and an intern named Elizabeth Ellis, or she's, she was an intern, um, have all done it in the past and have done really well. Um, CST 105 is kind of a nice opportunity for anyone who wants to get more instruction experience because it's essentially um, scripted. I mean, it's not quite that rigid, but we, um, I have a standard lesson plan um, that I teach for each version of it. And I just, whenever someone is going to help me with it, I just hand them the lesson plan and the materials. They're all standard. And there's room for a little bit of variation, but not much. So if a person is, is maybe a little bit nervous about doing instruction, um, it's a nice sort of opportunity to get your feet wet. It also lends itself to co-teaching really nicely. Um, I think I've co-taught some of these, uh, I know with Deborah in the past, um, and I think Melanie and I may have co-taught some as well. Um, so it's kind of a nice sort of, you know, you can kind of break it up in different ways. Um, so the focus is still the persuasive speech assignment. So as Jenny said, they need five sources. Two of them have to be um, peer reviewed articles, scholarly. Uh, and I, I emphasize for students or try to emphasize for students that scholarly and peer reviewed aren't necessarily the same, but we do tend to use the term interchangeably, um, particularly at the 100 level because that concept is, you know, it's difficult to grasp. Um, they also need two other reliable sources um, and they need to conduct an interview with someone. Uh, it can be um, 
their the parameters are pretty open. Um, they've tried not to make the assignment too rigid so that people have lots of options that they present to their classmates. And I believe it's no more than five minutes per person. It's probably less than that, actually. But yeah, so we're still doing persuasive speech assignment. Um, Amy, if you wanna, great. So a couple options that instructors have. So they can do completely in-person library instruction. Um, you could bring your class for a 50 minute session or a 75 minute session. Um, or if our labs are booked up, we only have two teaching labs in the library. Um, I will often go to their classroom, which is fine. Um, 50 or 75 minute, that's just sort of determined by how often the class meets. If it meets twice a week, it's going to be 75 minute. If it meets three times a week, it's going to be 50 minute. Um, so they could do that. There's also a hybrid model. So I recommend that if you have a 50 minute library session that you also have your students complete a short follow up module on Canvas, which takes them roughly 25 to 30 minutes and covers things that we don't have a chance to cover in the shorter version, which is like we get into how do you find books using the library's catalog or talking about um, you know, just, just more things about search strategies um, that we just don't have time to cover. And there's also in the follow-up module and the 75 minute sessions, we get into peer review just a little bit more. Um, it sort of depends on who's teaching it, but that's sort of the difference when I do it. Um, or you can do an exclusively online model. So you could just have your students complete a larger, more, um, you know, more content, um, a different campus module, which serves as a complete replacement for library instruction, or it attempts to be a complete replacement for library instruction. So, and I'm actually probably gonna be redoing that module this summer, but we'll see. And there was a Google site at one point. I, I really like Google and Google Sites. Um, and um, I attempted to make one that I felt was pretty, you know, pretty simple to use, pretty easy, pretty, you know, visually appealing, maybe more so than Canvas. Um, students just could not handle it. It was just, I, I think it was probably flawed design, maybe. I, I don't know. Um, it's also just, you know, students are really used to Canvas. Sam and I have talked about this a lot. Um, adding platforms really isn't uh, pedagogically like the best way to handle online instruction. You just kind of need to stick to what they already know and what they already have. So the Google site was quietly retired last year. Um, so concepts we cover in all of these formats, topic selection and refinement. So many times students will come in and they'll say, um, I want to do my persuasive speech on climate change. And that's, that's great, they have an idea, um, but I like to emphasize to them, I always encourage them to put it in the form of a question or a statement. So what is it about climate change that you want to tell us or persuade us of? Um, I encourage them to maybe narrow it down geographically. Um, so for instance, one, one topic that sometimes will come out of climate change a little bit more has to do with like EPA regulations in the United States should be stricter. Um, even something like that, narrowing it down just a little bit more can really help. Keyword formation, understanding what keywords are, why they matter, why you need to break them up in a particular way, which is really getting at Boolean searching. Um, I just don't tend to call it that for students. And then um, there's an activity that most sections will complete on evaluating sources, which we can look at in a second. Um, we obviously get into finding sources. We tend to focus more on the articles aspect, the peer reviewed articles, because that is sort of the most difficult or technically challenging thing um, to teach. Um, what is peer review? What does it mean for something to be scholarly? And then citations. Um, they are required to do written APA citations and they also have to include some oral citations, which aren't too challenging. Um, we like to kind of practice with them a little bit. And Amy, if you want to just quickly click on evaluating sources, I won't harp on this too much. This is an activity that I have students do. Um, I take some sample articles that break students up into groups. And we say, okay, click on the link next to your group's name, skim the article, and then you're gonna answer the associated questions. Um, there's an ABC framework that we use that's mentioned in their book um, that has to do with evaluating sources. So authority, accuracy, bias, currency, all those considerations. Um, so this is just a sample of 
students answering those questions. And I, I mean, I think that they're only given, when I do this activity, they're only given about seven minutes uh, to do it. Um, so that's why not every blank is filled in. Things aren't maybe as detailed as they could be. It's very much like a, um, it's very much a crash course in source evaluation. So, and I change the topic up every semester so that hopefully, uh, you know, we don't get too bored with it. I teach this like 30 times a semester, so it gets a little old after a while. <clears throat> Thanks, Amy. Um, so there are some remaining issues, some things that Jenny talked about are still are still an issue and I think will always be an issue. By the way, the spreadsheet evaluation activity was not created by me. Um, I was really lucky when I came into um, my job in January 2018, Amy and Jenny had already done so much of the work like building relationships with people involved in CST 105, like the course director, um, the lesson plan, Jenny handed me a lesson plan and materials and said, here's what I do. So I used that for the first semester that I was doing it. And I've really not tweaked it all that much because it's, you know, it's well done. Jenny's good at what she does. Um, so the spreadsheet activity was a Jenny Dale creation. Um, so still some issues. We have limited time. We will always have limited time. I think CST 105 is one of those courses like FYE. We're trying to pack so much into sort of the first year experience. And most of the people who take CSC 105 are first year students that like whenever there's something that we want them to cover, we like, oh, stick it in CSC 105 or stick it in FYE. Um, so we will always have limited time. But the Canvas module, I think, helps when people use those, um, whether it's the supplement to the shorter session or the completely online version. Asynchronous just allows students a little bit more flexibility to learn at their own pace. Um, students seem more prepared than in the past, and that's because I've sort of, um, you know, I make sure to, to be really, really clear with instructors before they come, like, please ask them to come at least with a topic in mind, and also just getting students more comfortable with the idea that your research is gonna evolve, your topic may change. So I tell them, even if you're not sure what your topic is gonna be, just pick something for purposes of our session that you that you can use, and I think that that may help. And I give them some samples. Um, and then obviously there's too much instruction for one person. There are 50 sections if we're teaching you know, 30 sections a semester. I, and they all want to come at the same time. I just can't be in one place or more than one place at a time. So I rely on, on other people to help for sure. I owe a lot of people, a lot of coffee for helping me. Assessment, so Jenny uh, created and Maggie created these SLOs. Um, a couple, I guess it's been summer 2018, I think. Um, and there are five of them, find, evaluate, create, credit, and use. And I said them out of order. Um, but I specifically have been focusing on find and evaluate over the last couple of years. And I think you'll have access to these slides so you can see the SLOs and kind of the descriptions. Um, okay, Jenny wrote the SLOs. Maggie just helped with the research. Maggie is very humble. It was a process. Um, I've added, I have continued to do some pre and post testing. Um, collecting feedback from instructors has been important. Um, I created some custom rubrics. Actually, Jenny had a rubric creating session where I sort of was able to finally sit down and make like a nice rubric for some of these assignments. And that's been really helpful. I actually score um, students' results and send them to instructors when they ask for that. And they will get a grade based on it in some classes. So I wanted to make sure that I was really, really consistent in um, how those were being evaluated. And then I put together an assessment report from 2018, 2019, which you can definitely browse through um, later on. It kind of breaks things down in terms of percentages and different measures that I try to use to help evaluate how we're doing. Um, COVID-19 is happening. Yes, you can find a sample of my rubrics in the fantastic volume, Teaching First Year College Students, A Practical Guide for Librarians by Maggie Murphy. Um, so COVID-19 is happening and that's affecting some things. Um, so the round tables, they still happen. It's still a thing. Um, we are trying to figure out right now how to do it in an online format. Um, we have some ideas, but I think uh, even as we speak, like this week, some of that is being worked out with the TAs. Jessica sort of um, 
helping to communicate with them about what they want to do, how we want to go forward. So we'll see. Uh, like many things, it, we're going day by day with this. And then the future of CST 105 in a post-COVID world. Um, you can go ahead. So do you want me to talk about this a little bit? Yes, if you would, that would be great. Okay. Hey, it's Amy again. Um, so as many of you know, um, I have been spending some time working on the general education revision. Um, and one of the competencies that is part of the new general education program is the oral communications competency. Um, and the people like Jessica McCall, who we've mentioned a few times, um, and other communication studies faculty were heavily involved in the development of that competency and the definition and the student learning outcomes and all that. Um, the wonderful communication studies faculty has said all along that they didn't foresee CST 105 being the only class that meets this requirement, um, but I think that it probably will end up being meeting the requirement for most students. Um, so this has a lot of potential to change the way that CST 105 works. Um, because right now, you know, like I said earlier, it's required for some majors. It does fill a requirement that not a lot of other classes fill that GRD marker. But this is a different ball game. Um, when the new general education program starts in fall of 2021, every student who starts at UNCG fall 2021 and later is going to have to take an oral communications class. And again, it will most likely be CST 105 um, unless other other departments um, decide that they want to start teaching this competency as well. Um, so it has the potential to have even more sections and serve even more students um, every semester. So um, things are about to get interesting. Yep. Yeah, go. and I think with, with that, I mean, I uh, have lost a little bit of sleep over this, like just thinking about as we add more sections, what sort of resources are we going to need in terms of, you know, do we need to hire a CST 105 practicum intern or something like that to help with the, uh, with the load. So there are things that we're talking about and doing, but yes, as Amy said, uh, the future is, is coming. Um, so I'm planning an article to follow up on the previous research about the roundtables that um, Maggie and a couple people from the Speaking Center did. Um, I'm also looking to just do some more general writing about CST 105 and how it works. Um, it's one of many, many models of first year instruction that exists and um, people might be interested to learn more about it. Um, the Communication Center Journal is where um, we're planning to submit something for uh, November 2020. Um, we will see, it all sort of depends on, on COVID and what's happening with that. It's hard to, um, you know, do assessment with this potential new uh, format that roundtables may take just for this semester. Maybe we'll do it online and exclusively in the future. There's some conversations happening. So some uncertainty, but we'll see. And I think, um, that, that may be it. Are there questions? Yeah, if y'all have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, one thing that I think has been kind of implied here, but definitely we haven't been explicit about, is that the person coordinating CSC 105 has to be super organized. Um, and I think it's safe to say this, uh, Amy, but Amy and I have many, many wonderful qualities, each of us. Being organized is not one of those qualities, I would say, probably for either of us. What? I'm just kidding. I yes. know. Sorry. 100% true. Um, and so, Rachel, I really feel that Rachel has taken this class to a whole new level because of her, like, ex I mean, she's so good at organization. I feel like she came in and the first week I was supervising her, I was like, wow, she's got it, like, figured out. So... I think that that is really necessary for this kind of class. 
Um, as I mentioned in the chat once, like there are times when three of these sessions are happening at the same time. Like there's one in the city lab, there's one in 177A, and there's one going on in somebody's classroom. And that is so hard to keep track of. So kudos to Rachel for being like, uh, ooh, what a great idea, Lois. Yeah, that oh would my be gosh. Epic. Yeah, that's cool. I could definitely talk about um, how I do stuff. A lot of it's just being really pushy um, and bossy. He's a logistical um, genius. <laughs> like, I sw I'm not even exaggerating. We we yeah, if we ever have anything where we need to schedule a lot of stuff, we just give it to her and ask her to do it. She that thinks about fun. things that we don't even consider. That's funny. My, uh, in I my think that's great. Life, in my personal life, stuff is just everywhere. Like my at my house, things are just thrown all over the place. But digitally, yes, things are, are quite in place. Well, I love that idea, Rachel. I'll be following up with you. Thank you, Lois. Looks like there's a lot of interest. Yeah. All right. Do folks have other questions? We just did such a good job that I, I guess we did. Oh, yes. Thank you, Sarah. I was, uh, oh, Joe has one. Yay. Oh, goody. Oh. Yeah. Joe has a history question. Construction in the background is like audible. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I bet like the history of that. Like, so is that something where just because people have been involved with this project who are still here and who, like, you know, kind of remember how it was or did y'all have to consult a lot of people like, hey, how did this start? Um, because I'm in a couple of things where the history is kind of murky and, you know, I've, I've inherited things um, from folks and just am not sure where they're from. So, but you guys have like the whole thing. Yeah. I, and I think um, this is really unusual. Um, I was trying to think if there are other things like this where we have, like, that's why we call this generations, right? Where we have the last the current person and the two previous persons in this position all still working here. Um, I think that I, I love, I love that that's the case. Um, sometimes I think in certain situations that could be hard. Like I will be full, I will fully admit it was hard for me to let go of CST 105, um, especially because the, the first time I let it go, I had to take it back pretty soon after unexpectedly. Um, and then I was like, well, this is just like my baby. I, I have taken this from like what was already established by Amy and what was already a strong program and like had then kind of put my touches on it just the same way that Rachel has. Um, but we pretty much have the history just because we're still here. Um, I, we have tried to document the history of this to a certain extent because I anticipate this always being a class uh, that lots of UNCG students take. Um, but yeah, I, I think what you're saying, Joe, about being so, sort of like, well, I know this has been done before, but how and when and who? Um, so yeah, I think keeping documentation about what we hope will be ongoing programs is really important. And that's another, again, big strength of Rachel's. So way to go, Rachel. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just want to say that, first of all, I do have a problem with being the grandmother in this generation situation, but, you know, whatever, it's fine. Um, but it. I, I just, yeah, I agree with everything Jenny said. It is a kind of an interesting situation to, wait, you're only 27? Are you kidding me? I'm just kidding. It's it's a very ongoing joke that, um, yeah, we made it 51 minutes, y'all, before um, Rachel's age came into play. Um, but yeah, it is an interesting situation to have this much history. And just as a side note, um, so, I don't want to talk too much about Gen Ed, though I will do a UL VLC presentation about it if people are interested. Um, but it's interesting to note that the oral communications competency actually doesn't have information literacy in it. Um, a couple of the competencies now have information literacy listed explicitly. Um, but I think that and Rachel, you can add on to this, but I'm pretty sure that Jessica McCall, who's the course coordinator, went to Rachel pretty much immediately and said, just want to let you know that we're still, we still intend to continue the research part. So even though it's not an explicit part of the learning outcomes, 
um, it still is going to continue to involve the library in the future. Yeah, I think that CSC 105 instructors are, they have a lot going on and a lot to do, and a lot of them are adjuncts or students themselves. So yeah, I think that we're, um, the plan is definitely still to be involved and probably ramping up involvement. So yeah, it's, uh, Jessica's really great and is, is definitely committed to um, the relationship with the library. All right, are there any other questions? I think you all know how to get in touch with us if you do have questions. Um, I wanna just say thank you so much for all of you for attending and thank you Rachel and Amy for agreeing to present this with me. Um, if people don't have questions, we're gonna go ahead and do the thing where I stop the recording. Thanks Kathy, I'm glad that was interesting.